on the earthly realm you have man, and below man you have the animals, and below the animals you have the plants, and below those, the minerals. And then with respect to the mineral world, you have the, the whole seven thing that, metals. The whole thing the great chain of being, or yeah, the whole, the whole structure okay. is regarded as the great chain of being. And it's taught in various ways. The, the Plotinus' version is simply one version of it, but it's really the, the sort of conceptual schematic backbone. But you find in the history of Renaissance art, for example, um, you find visual translations of it. Uh, but it follows the same general schema. And so we have man, man is the noblest thing on earth. Now, uh, <clears throat> with respect to this tradition, man is a microcosm of the entire created cosmos. So we are miniature versions of the whole structure of the cosmos. And the way in which this works is, um, the heavenly world corresponds what, to what a man is the soul, and the natural world corresponds to what a man is the body. And then it gets broken down even further from that. There are two fundamental aspects to the soul. There is the aspect of the soul that is tied in closer with the body, and this has to do with uh, the organs of generation, propagation, evacuation, essentially the sex organs, and the excretory organs, um, their animating aspect, their soulful, the, the aspect that animates them and ties them up with the body. Um, and then you move up from that and you have the senses. This is, uh, these are all regarded as the lower soul. And then you move up from that and you have the imagination, which essentially confers unity on the material that comes to one through the gates of the senses. The imagination is that which confers synthetic unity on the manifold of what appears to us to be the external world. And this is regarded as the lower soul. And then the higher soul simply um, is comprised of two faculties, mind and reason. And they're two very different uh, faculties. Reason is closer to the anima secunda, or the secondary anima. This is the anima prima, the primary anima closer to the heavens, as it were, um, and my, uh, mind at the top. And mind corresponds to what in us is essentially new, the realm of the pure, pure knowledge, the eternal structural laws of being. Man, however, possesses reason. And man is unique. In the entire great chain of being, man, in this Renaissance philosophy, is totally different from everything else. Um, the central text summarizing the vision of the Renaissance is Oration on the Dignity of Man by Pico della Mirandola. And he goes in and he says, well, you know what? When I look at this, I see that man is actually superior even to the angels because he possesses reason, and reason is free. Nothing else is. All of the lower anima animalistic faculties of man are bound by determinism, by the influence of the stars, and the mind is bound to be only what it is, pure divine knowledge, what Hillman would call spirit. Whereas reason is free to choose. It can turn up and contemplate the divine forms, or it can turn down and seek for pleasure through the pursuit of desire in the physical world, through food, sex, materialistic acquisitions of wealth. The reason can turn either way. And man is the only being in all of creation that has this freedom to choose which way he's going to turn, to look up or look down. And so the goal is to, to use reason to free uh, the soul from the influence of the body. And so almost all the Renaissance paintings from Botticelli on down are simply visual illustrations of this, of this philosophy of liberating the soul from uh, uh, the senses to contemplate the divine forms. So that's the vision of the anima mundi that science then began to dismantle. And it did so uh, in the following way. Now what I want to do is sort of walk you through the history of seven key turning points, we might call them seven revolutions, seven scientific revolutions. And we go back to the 15th century for the first one. Remember in the 15th century, as we discussed before, we had the invention of depth perspective right about 1400. And with the invention of depth perspective, painting came as close as it has ever come to being regarded as a science because it involved the use of geometry to work out the perspective. So the arts were beginning to be thought of as science, scientific in that sense, and there was a kind of interplay between the sciences and the arts. The two were regarded as uh, essentially you know, two sides of one scale. <coughs> now the first of these revolutions <coughs> is the Colombian. <coughs> uh, Columbus discovers America in 1492, as we all know, 
Um, but now note that Columbus is an exact contemporary of Leonardo da Vinci, who dies in 1519, 1520, something like that, and of Michelangelo, who was uh, younger, but coming along. And uh, the Renaissance is in full form in Italy when Columbus is going about discovering uh, America. Now, what Columbus does is he sets out with this vision in his mind that the Earth is round. Now, everybody knew in the intelligentsia that the Earth was round. The popular consciousness thought it was flat because it was biblically taught that it was flat. But the intelligentsia knew that it was round because during the course of the 15th century, the texts of Ptolemy had been discovered, his maps had been discovered, the Greeks knew very well that the Earth was round, and there was a recovery of this Greek knowledge, and um, everybody knew that it was round. They didn't know how big it was. Um, it turns out, actually, the Greeks, Eratosthenes, estimated its circumference to very, I mean, ridiculously close to what it actually is. But Ptolemy underestimated how, what the circumference of the Earth was, and then Columbus, glossing on him, further underestimated Ptolemy. So he thought that if the Earth was round, theoretically, it should be possible to gain access to the East Indies and to Japan if one sailed west. That would follow if the Earth is round. And if that would happen, then there you wouldn't have to go uh, Spain and uh, Italy, and uh, wouldn't have to go through the Arabs to get to the riches of the Far East, the silks of China and the, the spices of India and all that wonderful stuff. Uh, but Columbus had a hard time selling his idea. He went back and forth between the Portuguese and the Spaniards, and um, finally, um, his voyage was uh, sanctified, as it were, by uh, Isabella and Ferdinand, and he set off thinking that uh, Japan would be much closer than it actually was. And the crew thought that they were just going to sail off the edge of the earth, so he had to constantly keep reassuring them that it was just a little further, a little farther away. But now, I want to look at the image that Columbus had in his head, more specifically, uh, the image of Dante's vision of the cosmos. Dante was actually quite hip for living uh, 100 years, 200 years prior here. He was living in 1300. And um, Dante knew even then, prior to the rediscovery of the Ptolemaic maps, that the Earth was round. <clears throat> and this is sort of the vision of the Earth that Columbus has in his mind as he's sailing. According to Dante, after you get out of all of these spheres and you come down to the level of the Earth, he sort of puts Jerusalem at the top as the sort of Jerusalem, remember, was the center of the world during the medieval period. And the three great continents are all in the northern hemisphere for Dante. And everything that's in the south is just pure water. And at the southern hemisphere, we have Mount Purgatory pointing downward, sort of upside down. <clears throat> and what Dante said was when Satan was cast out from heaven, he sort of crashed into the earth like a comet just went barreling right down the center of it and opened up within the core of the earth this huge series of concentric crevices so that Satan then is thrust upside down in the earth with his three faces. Um, that's an interesting idea because remember, the earth is at the center of the universe here and if Satan is at the center of the earth, then the entire Christian universe revolves around Satan. It's an interesting little thing that Dante sneaks in. <laughs> And um, so as Dante goes down, and he's taken down by Virgil, who personifies now reason. Dante is beginning to bring in the uh, Neoplatonic conception that we've talked about, and Virgil is the personification of reason, and Dante is being instructed as he goes down through these levels of hell and encounters all these uh, vices, what happens to people who don't disengage their reason from their uh, bodies, and they sort of takes them on that guided tour, and then they come out and... Um, the, uh, the earth that Satan has displaced has been pushed up as purgatory. And it is seven stories, as uh, hell is seven stories. And this is a seven-story mountain. And at the top of purgatory is actually Eden. <clears throat> so Virgil leads them up through the seven-story mountain of purgatory. They get to Eden. And from the center of Eden flow the four rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates and the other two whose names I can never remember. And they are flowing upward from south to north. And they are the source of all the waters of the world. Now, um, the Nile's got to be in there, doesn't it? I'm sorry? The Nile? Yes, well, the Nile, remember, uh, in, on the TNO maps, Dante's simply doing a variation of the TNO maps, where um, Jerusalem was the, the dead center of the world, and the world itself was flat and was composed of three continents. Asia is in the north, tends to orient yourself, means to face toward Asia, and uh, I believe Europe in the south and Africa and the other southern hemisphere. And these were all biblical descendants. And um, 
The this was the Mediterranean, the crossbar going this way, and the crossbar going this way.